Hi, I'm Aaron Hamlin. I'm here with the Center for Election Science, and today we are excited to have Dr. Kalina Kamanova and Dr. Nicole Goodman here with us in order to talk about citizen juries. Uh, going first to Dr. Uh, Kalina Kamanova. Um, Kalina is a research associate with the Health Law Institute in the Faculty of Law at the University of Alberta. In 2012 to 2013, she held a postdoctoral appointment as the inaugural research director of the newly established Center of Public Involvement at the University of Alberta. Her research interests are interdisciplinary and include deliberative de democracy and participatory governance, pub public engagement with science and technology, and science communication. Dr. Nicole Goodman is a research fellow at the Innovation Policy Lab in the Monk School of Global Affairs and an assistant professor of political science at McMaster University. Her research focuses on political participation. She is particularly interested in the impact of digital and mobile technologies on participation. She served as an advisor and expert witness for the Edmonton Citizens Juries on Internet Voting and wrote the issues guide that informed that jury participants. Kalina and Nicole, thank you both for joining us here. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Right. So Kalina, what is a citizen's jury and who sits on it? A citizen's juries are uh, an innovative deliberative method of political participation which promotes direct involvement of citizens in policy development, strategic planning or technology assessment. Uh, the major assumption of this approach is that lay people can make well-reasoned decisions on complex problems, uh, particularly when they participate in focused deliberative processes. Uh, usually, uh, juries uh, include a small group of citizens, uh, and the major assumption behind this approach is uh, that it relies on uh, the participatory representativeness of this small group of citizens rather than statistical representativeness achieved through more traditional consultation approaches such as polling uh, a large group of people. Uh, juries are usually composed of uh, 12 to 24 members who are randomly selected from the general public and uh, uh, in most cases, the goal is to achieve a demographically diverse group, a mini public, which is representative of the larger population. In some cases, um, the method which is util utilized to select jury members um, is a stratified random sampling, which means that um, the organizers of the process uh, select, uh, make effort to include uh, citizens from uh, underrepresented groups, particularly minorities, and uh, they conduct not just random recru recruitment, but they also target those particular groups. And in many cases, some additional attitudinal screening of the members is conducted to ensure that the jury is reflective of a broad range of societal views. So you're saying that they identify certain demographics that they deem as being important, and that they make sure that those demographic demographics are represented on the jury itself? Yes, uh, because traditionally uh, certain groups in societies are run to underrepresented in decision making, so the jury approach is more inclusive because it targets members of these groups. Uh, for example, minorities, they have not been, uh, many of the minority gr groups have not been part of the political process, and when you do stratified uh, random sampling, you can uh, target these particular groups and have representatives on, the, on a citizen's jury. So it's one way to reach to those people who usually uh, remain underrepresented in political decision making. Now maybe both uh, you and Nicole can help me on this one. So what are the benefits of using a citizen jury? I mean we have legislatures, we have parliaments. What does this offer that a parliament or a legislature doesn't. Most uh, most democratic systems are systems of repre representative democracy, whereby we elect representatives to make decisions for us. 
Um, and sometimes um, it's more difficult for those representatives to make choices that reflect the uh, wishes of the population and the interests of the population because they're seeking to aggregate those interests. So it's really nice once in a while to try and bring the public voice into policy making and decision making um, because that may offer a different perspective um, and embody a different set of values than those of elected representatives. That's one of the main advantages. Another benefit of this approach is that public involvement uh, in many cases is uh, being done like by using uh, um, just pro forma techniques like for example the members of the public are simply informed about what the government intends to do or they're just consulted and using an approach so, such as uh, a citizen's jury like allows like members of the public to be involved in a more meaningful way because it's a process which involves learning and it's a process which also empowers citizens uh, by placing decision making in the hands of those citizens that participate in the process. Mm -hmm. Yes, it can, it can add value to um, systems of re representative government and decision making that can often be deficient and ineffective. And it can also um, demonstrate the competency and capability of lay citizens to participate in these types of processes and learn about and weigh in on complex policy issues. Now, um, uh, Nicole, how, how do we know about the competence of the people that are on the juries? How do we make sure that they're prepared because, I mean, some of the matters that these juries may be discussing are things that may be complex. How can we be sure that uh, they're well suited? I think typically the issues are complex or controversial because I think the issues that are selected um, for these types of forums are typically issues that elected representatives don't want to weigh in on themselves, either because they're political hot potatoes or because they may have a particular um, a stake or a vested interest in the outcome of the issue themselves. Presumably what we want to represent in these, in these decisions and policies is the will of the people and who better to represent the will of the people than a group that is chosen demographically from the population and some citizens juries like the Edmonton citizens jury have also um, done representation attitudinally as well. I think the point that Nicole raised about the jury being representative of the larger community was really good because uh, the expectation during the deliberative process is that when jurors hear evidence from expert witnesses and when they question these witnesses and when they critically review and evaluate the information and finally engage in sustained discussions and deliberation, uh, the verdict that they will develop, like the verdict that they will achieve on the issue or question under consideration will be reflective of the wisdom of the entire community. So it's, uh, it's, it's this powerful idea about like bringing the voice of the public uh, into decision making and what gives confidence like to elected representatives when they conduct the citizen's jury process is that the verdict achieved by the jurors like will be the same, you know, as if the entire, the entire community has deliberated. And I think you have to think about um, what, what does a qualified person mean? What characteristics do they have to embody? And can we say that elected representatives are particularly qualified? Um, the people that um, enter into the jury uh, process, they go through, um, they hear from expert testimony, they engage in uh, de extensive deliberation, and it's carried out over a longer time frame than typically occurs um, in, you know, traditional uh, legislative um, policy development and decision making. So they really have a lot more information to be able to um, base their decisions on. In addition, they are often, as you mentioned, uh, demographically representative of the population and sometimes, as in the case of the Edmonton Citizens Jury, attitudinally representative of the population and who better to make a decision based on the public will than a group that is a mini public essentially, uh, demographically and attitudinally of the larger populace. Okay, and, and uh, Kalina, maybe you can speak to a little bit more um, as far as what exactly the citizens' juries is going to be taking in. So they're going to be getting a lot of information. How are they getting that information? Is it going to be expert testimony? Are they going to have to read a bunch of books? Like, what exactly are they doing? 
Well, usually uh, the process starts by uh, bringing, selecting experts uh, to participate in the deliberative process and then bringing those experts to give uh, a testimony uh, and present like on the issues under consideration and you also provide an opportunity for the citizens participating in the jury process to question these experts and uh, also jurors are, jurors are provided with learning materials in advance which was the strategy that we used like uh, during the Edmonton City Jury on Internet voting. Nicole uh, developed this study guide which summarized like major concerns and issues uh, concerning internet voting and jurors were like presenting with the guide, they were provided with uh, learning materials in advance so they had an opportunity to like study this, uh, the subject matter, like do their own research and then meet like with leading experts in the field and question those experts. So by the end of the uh, jury process, uh, the 17 citizens that were involved in it uh, they became experts on internet voting. Like we were surprised that they learned so much and they could make such a good and informed decision on the policy question that, uh, on the charge question that uh, uh, was uh, developed for them. Now, now Clean, I mean we're talking about some complex issues here. I mean it sounds like they're able to get a lot of information but how much time do they have to do this? So I mean it's, it's a matter of months that they're looking at this? How long does this take? Uh, citizen jury is, uh, uh, well, different formats are used, so uh, there is no one uh, specific uh, time frame that works in, uh, in each case. Uh, so uh, usually, uh, like citizen juries adopt a shorter time frame compared to other deliberative forums. So uh, the citizen jury on the internet voting in Edmonton took place over uh, one weekend. So practically it started on Friday afternoon and the verdict was delivered by the citizens on Sunday uh, in the late afternoon on Sunday so it took about two days and a half of like intense uh, learning and deliberations and also like the jurors like heard presentations like short presentations from experts they had time to uh, to question these experts and raise concerns about some of the issues so different formats are used around the world. It really depends like on uh, uh, how you design the deliberative process and what type of question or policy concern is addressed by the jury. If it's something that requires a more, uh, more extensive learning process, then you know it, uh, would be, it, would make sense, it would make sense for the jury process to take place over several weeks. Uh, if it's a very narrow particular policy question, uh, the duration could be several days. So it's really, it really depends on the design and the type of concern that is being addressed by citizens. Now, now Kalina, when, when this is over with and the jury has its recommendation, so is that binding? Is this just a recommendation for the legislature to follow? Um, what, what's going on here? Um, citizen juries like are still considered to be an uh, experimental approach. Uh, so in uh, most of the jurisdiction where citizen jury were convened, uh, the decision was not legally binding, uh, which is probably one of the deficiencies of this approach because uh, policymakers and elected officials can choose to ignore the recommendations of a citizen jury which is what happened in, in Edmonton. Um, the only place where citizens juries are legally binding is Oregon, uh, which uh, recently adopted about two years ago uh, the Citizens Review Initiative, which institutionalized the citizen jury process uh, to review ballot measures. Um, this is a really, really uh, important issue about how you make a jury verdict or recommendations legally binding because if we want to have a more efficient process um, it would be we, we should better make this uh, deliberative forums legally binding but unfortunately it has only happened in Oregon and in other places uh, it is it is really up to elective representatives and policymakers to decide whether they will um, 
act on the jury recommendations. So, uh, Kalina just said that not always are the citizen juries binding. I mean, sometimes they're just giving recommendations. So after they go through this process, they take in all this information, and they give a, a non-binding recommendation, does that still have value even though it's not binding? I think it depends. Um, in the case of the Edmonton Citizens Jury, if we can talk about it in terms of a specific case study, um, the, uh, the, the city council actually ended up rejecting the jury verdict. So um, perhaps I should give you a little bit of background to contextualize. So sure. the, Edmonton, sure. the Edmonton Citizens Jury was composed to weigh in on the topic of introducing internet voting in local elections um, in the city of Edmonton. And they ended up deliberating and um, unanimously decided after some further deliberation that they wanted to see internet voting. They thought it was a good idea um, to be used in um, elections moving forward at the local level. Well, when city council ended up voting on it, they ended up actually rejecting the internet voting proposal. So this situation truly speaks to the question of, um, you know, should should verdicts be binding because the city invested all of this money to uh, bring people on, design the process, then train these people. The people were brought in and you know this was seen to enhance their faith and legitimacy and responsiveness in government and then they went ahead and rejected it. So, so what does that mean? Well, they also put forward some recommendations and the city did promise to take those recommendations forward and consider them in future policy development. Um, this particular instance is very interesting because although the citizens jury was a large component of the process, there were other special interest groups that also participated in the process as well and I think some of them felt like their voices were not heard through the jury process so they went to other channels. So this was kind of a unique mix of political participation where you saw a group of uh, citizens that were demographically and attitudinally representative of population coming together and deliberating on a very important and complex policy issue um, and experts of course came but then some people who wanted their voices heard didn't feel that this was inclusive enough or representative enough and so they sort of went in the back door channels and it ended up being um, well we, we don't know for certain but I think that those voices did have an impact on 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 the verdict so more generally, can these recommendations have, have an impact? I think they can have an impact. Um, they can have an impact if the policy changes were visited in the future. That could be something that government could look back upon at that point and say, these were the recommendations that the citizens jury put forward at that time. And you know maybe we should take these into consideration as we're moving forward with policy development, particularly if they decide not to engage in a deliberative method again. Also, um, other governments may be considering this policy change um, who maybe don't have the funds to pursue a citizen's jury can benefit from the wisdom of those recommendations if they're made public. Sure, and, and when, you, when you speak to the recommendations being made public, is it just uh, we make this recommendation, like a short little uh, bit about that recommendation, or is it more elaborate in going into the, the deliberative process as far as how they came to that recommendation? No, I think it's more basic. So they have a very short time to sort of write up the report in terms of what I would think to write a report. So it's written in very clear, plain language and just sort of essentially gets to the essence of um, the, the action or inaction that they're suggesting. Here you mentioned in Edmonton internet voting. So um, what other types of issues might be discussed in these citizen juries? Uh, yes, when, when I was thinking about this question, I was thinking about it in terms of citizens' juries and citizens' assemblies. And citizens' assemblies are another type of deliberative forum uh, where citizens can be brought into the decision-making process and uh, be educated um, through expert testimony and deliberation um, to decide on a particular policy issue. So I sort of think that the types of issues that are addressed by these forums can be grouped into three categories. Um, one, I think we see controversial issues um, being addressed and a really good example of that is electoral reform um, that was examined by citizens assemblies in Canada in British Columbia and in Ontario. Electoral reform is always a very contentious issue especially for politicians who essentially um, are put into those positions and ha have their livelihood depending on the electoral system that's putting them in power. So because they have a vested interest in this uh, in this system selection, they're maybe not the best ones to be making the, the decisions. 
Um, Internet voting is also seen as a topic that's very controversial as well, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, there are uh, certain groups who are ardent defenders of it, and they say it really promotes accessibility and convenience and makes the electoral process a lot easier for people to participate and also encourages engagement. And then there's another camp who argues um, very strongly about security threats and issues. So very, very controversial. Um, the second type, I would say, is something that has been difficult to resolve. So maybe an issue that has been persistent in the policy arena for some time. Maybe the government has tried something already and it hasn't really worked out that well. So they go and they seek out the public and they try and see if they can um, take out any you know, wisdom or knowledge or ideas from the public that they couldn't come up with themselves going through these traditional processes. A good example of that is a citizen, citizen's assembly sorry, that recently took place in Prince Edward County in Ontario um, to debate over the size of council review. This is a problem that they weren't able to solve and it, it had um, generated a lot of local debate. Um, and then the third area, I think, is unique policy problems or issues. Mm -hmm. So um, something that uh, maybe it hasn't necessarily been a, a pressing issue, but it's very um, it's very unique. And um, in South, South Australia right now, they're currently completing a citizen's jury process, um, which aims to make a certain community's nightlife safer and more vibrant. So um, not your typical policy issue, and maybe not controversial or a pressing problem, but I think that's definitely a unique policy issue. And I think uh, certainly we can we can see the benefit of having a citizen jury, especially for something like uh, electoral issues, where there is a where there's a clear conflict of interest from the, the legislature. Now, um, Kalina. This um, the idea of system series. Is this something that's new, or is this something that's been around for a while, or wh where has this been used before? Uh, it's uh, it's still considered an innovative deliberative uh, method uh, because uh, mainly because you know the process has not been institutionalized, like with the exceptions of uh, the Oregon Citizens Review Initiative. But it's uh, it's not it's not a new concept. Uh, the citizenry method originated in the early 1970s with the development of a method of deliberation called planning cell, and this was developed by Professor Peter uh, uh, Dino at the Research Institute for Citizen Pr Participation and Planning Procedures at the uh, Univ University of. Uh, uh, Wuppertal in Germany. So uh, independently, so in Germany they experimented with citizen juries, like particularly on a, a range like of uh, urban planning issues, also like for uh, social policy development. So it turned out to be a very effective approach. And uh, the planning cells like are very similar to the citizen jury because they use a small group of people, like up to 25, 30 and they engage them like in a deliberation and in a learning process on the issues under consideration. So independently of, uh, uh, of the Germans, a similar process, a citizen jury process was modeled in the mid-1970s uh, under the name of uh, Citizens Committee by Ned Crosby at the Jefferson Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And in the late 1980s, Crosby adopted the term citizen jury. So this is like a little bit of a history about the process. Uh, Crosby also registered the trademark on the uh, term citizens jury in the United States. So now every time uh, when you design such a process in the US, you have to acknowledge that the trademark that uh, the Jefferson Center has it. So it's been around for a while, and uh, citizen juries have been used like in a number of countries around the world. They have been popular in the UK, in Europe, also in Germany, in Italy, and France. In Australia, there there have been a number of citizen juries convened on a whole range of like uh, urban planning, technology development, technology assessment, and uh, policy development issues. In Canada is a relatively uh, new approach, um, and the citizen jury on internet voting in Edmonton was basically the first ever citizen jury in Canada uh, where uh, citizens presented their recommendations directly to uh, 
a body of elected representatives in this uh, in this case uh, city council Edmonton city council Nicole you had mentioned you were talking before about um, binding versus non-binding uh, recommendations from the citizen jury and now what kind of role do you think media is going to play into that as far as uh, having the public become more aware and perhaps pressuring pressuring the legislature to go in a certain direction. I think the media is extremely important. And first, I'm going to answer your question, and then I'll provide an interesting example that that shows uh, that shows this uh, in the Canadian context. Um, I think the media is really important to hold the government's feet to, feet to the fire and hold them to account. Um, in the case of the Edmonton Citizens Jury, you know the the city did invest quite a bit of money in into this process and then when the when the citizens jury verdict was not um, followed upon followed through with by council um, you have to think what are the implications of this so if in other situations this is occurring and these verdicts are non-binding then it's the public's job to hold the government's feet to the fire and how do they find out about this well through the media um, and it's also you know the media's job um, as sort of the democratic arbiter to be reporting on this and providing the, the public with this information so that they can act accordingly. Um, I think the media has an interesting role in this process generally and I think an excellent example of that is the British Columbia Citizens Assembly, if I may. Um, the British Columbia Citizens Assembly was very controversial, its, intro its introduction. Um, for electoral reform. Um, British Columbia went through a series of wrong winner scenarios where the wrong government was elected and the Liberals ended up, when they were on the, the, the other side of the fence, when they were not in power, uh, they said, you know, when we get into power we promise we're going to revisit this and then they, when they were actually in power they were much more reluctant to revisit electoral reform but because of public pressure they did. They went through the Citizens Assembly process, they invested a lot of money uh, the whole process went from um, January to December 2004 just for the deliberation, learning, and recommendation. So you can imagine this was an extremely lengthy and cost-intensive process. At the end of the process, the, the recommendation of the Citizens Assembly was put to a public referendum. And it was the government's job to provide funding to sort of ad advertise this, or the media, the media was supposed to report on it as well. But the government invested a fraction, a small fraction of the money on advertising and it didn't pick up as much um, in the media as it maybe should have and as a consequence it narrowly failed, uh, just very narrowly and afterwards when people were interviewed they said they were just not aware of it and one of the main reasons that was cited for this was because of lack of media attention and the irony of how so much money went into the development of this process and the deliberation but not into the public dissemination of the findings. And now here you're talking about the referendum for single transferable vote in British Columbia, is that what you're talking about? That's correct, yes. Okay. So I just think it's interesting, not only you know, should the media play an important role in terms of um, getting the verdicts out there, especially for citizens' juries that are non-binding so the public can, as I said, you know, tr try and hold the government to this process. They've invested in the process for a reason. They should trust in, these, uh, in the in chosen individuals but also in uh, disseminating and getting uh, the information out there more generally, especially in cases such as the Citizens' Assembly for electoral reform when there was a referendum and then not much was said about it. But also I think, you know, uh, media plays a, media can play a key role in educating citizens about uh, this type of deliberative processes and why they are so important and how they can empower citizens like to participate in decision making because we live uh, in, a, in a mediated reality and like media is the major source of information on political and social issues for uh, the general public so the more people know about these deliberative methods uh, the more inclined uh, elected representatives will be like to support the use of such method so when implementing the citizens jury and this is the lesson that we learned like uh, in Edmonton because we designed a really good process and then we engaged the municipal government and we convinced them to finance the process and uh, present and participate in it and present the verdict to city council but we did not work closely with the, with the media and what happened in the end uh, um, like I think this 
to uh, to a certain extent this influenced like the outcome of the process when city council voted against the internet voting proposal I think council was like uh, used media as the major source of information and the voices of those stakeholders groups that did not participate in the jury process were really heard why you know councilors did not know about the jury process uh, given the fact that you know it was not really uh, you know, there wasn't a lot about it in the media. Like media obviously covered uh, the verdict of the of the season jury, but the coverage did not include information about the process itself, how participants were recruited, uh, why this was such an important event, uh, and 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 this affected at the end, you know, the the outcome of the entire process. So media, it is very important to work with the media when implementing a season jury process in any any jurisdiction. Because media has like a great impact on how people think about politics in general. And, and you can imagine that that being especially the case uh, with uh, British Columbia and looking at the alternative voting method. Um, you, you recently in Canada had an election where uh, a conservative faction had less than 40% of the vote and yet they got more than 50% of the seats. And, and you're pushing uh, in, in that particular a uh, refer uh, a citizens jury and the referendum was looking at a proportional method, which, if the media perhaps had been uh, more on their game, would be able to show that proportional methods do a much better job at creating a buffer uh, against these what are called false majorities when you have people that have a minority of the vote get more than half the seats. Yes, that's totally true. The last time in a, in Canada that a majority government was elected with a majority of the vote was in 1984 and that was just by just by a hair because I think they had 50.9 percent of the votes so it's a rarity in Canadian politics uh, you know given our regional issues um, and our um, single member plurality electoral system that we see majority governments elected with a majority of the vote typically it's a plurality of the vote and usually not a large plurality now we've been uh, talking about citizen juries, and I think something that is going to be on a lot of people's minds is what's like what's the price tag on this? What's this going to cost the people? Uh, yes. So in terms of the price tag, I don't think there's any any hard fast rules about how much something like this costs. I think the cost is really built into the design and the length of time that the process is carried out. So um, some citizens' juries take place longer than others. The Edmonton citizens' jury, you know, met and deliberated over a weekend. In the case of the South Australian citizens' jury, they're meeting six times over a number of months. So that would be much more costly. So I think um, the nature of the cost really depends on the design, um, the unique features um, that you put into the planning of the process. Well, you, you mentioned in Edmonton that it was a shorter time frame. So, like, what was uh, the cost in Edmonton? I think Kalina could comment to that directly. So, at the time, I was the research director of the Center for Public Involvement, which was the organization which designed and implemented the process. And we were commissioned by the city of Edmonton uh, to develop the entire public involvement campaign around the uh, internet voting proposal. So uh, the the money that we received from them, and uh, this is not a secret because it was like because the Center for Public Involvement was an affiliated academic center, so the money were like uh, it was practically a research grant. So we received about seventy thousand, but this seventy thousand Canadian dollars, but this included like a number of different components, not just the citizens jury itself. So I say it was a very uh, so this included like the development of an online survey, uh, stakeholder consultation meetings, and the citizen jury process. So the jury process was just just the third component of this entire public involvement campaign. And I would say, given given the amount of money we received, um, it was a very cost-effective approach. I would say about one third of the of the money that we received. Uh, was used like to design the process, and we um, oh one of the one of the interesting issues is about payment. So there's like there's a huge controversy surrounding uh, the issue of whether uh, participants in citizen jury should be paid, like whether they should they, they should receive uh, monetary awards. 
and we decided to pay the jurors for their time and they were paid like a really small amount which compensated them for uh, spending three days uh, in deliberation and attending in person. Um, so we paid them about uh, $400 per person. So it's like it's a very it's, it's practically a symbolic honorarium that is being paid to them. So it was uh, so when you take this into account, and we also provided like expert witnesses uh, uh, with like some compensation for their expenses. Those of them uh, who traveled to Edmonton, and we also provided them with a with a small a small honorarium. And of course, there was some money involved in like booking a venue and. Um, logistics and catering. So I would say like it's a really cost effective approach. So say a city hears about this and they become really interested. Like what kind of steps do they need to do? Or uh, say say they as they're going along, is there anything that you would recommend that a city keep in mind as they're starting this up and pushing for citizens jury? And you need people with expertise who will be able to design the entire process. Uh, what uh, more helped in the case of Edmonton was that the Center for Public Involvement at the University of Alberta had established an institutional partnership with the city of Edmonton. So the center itself is uh, uh, partially funded by, by the city. So because of this, you know, uh, this facilitated like the process, like obviously uh, citizen jury like are a very innovative approach. Uh, and usually the idea comes from academics, particularly uh, people who specialize in deliberative democracy and participatory governance. Uh, but in order to implement this idea, you need like the collaboration of, uh, of, of government, you need the collaboration of public participation practitioners. So we, uh, the Center for Public Involvement had all this component. So we had established like institutional partnership with the city we also work with the uh, International Association of the Public Participation Practitioners, so we could draw on their resources to um, select uh, uh, moderators, facilitators of the citizen jury process, which is a very, very important uh, aspect of the process. So this helped. Um, so uh, in the case of other cities, I guess like. First of all, you need some like enthusiasm and like people who propose this idea to the municipal government because like it's it's unlikely that bureaucrats would come up with this idea. Maybe some progressive bureaucrats, but in the case of like in the case of the city of Edmonton, we just met with the uh, with the project with the election project with the internet voting project team and we proposed the use of this deliberative method. And we explain what it uh, what it involves. Uh, so um, they they were really fascinated with like they they liked the approach. They thought that it was like very innovative because. So you just found uh, some receptive people, some receptive policymakers within the city. Yeah, that that's one good strategy, like finding receptive uh, uh, senior administrators, like at different levels or elected representatives people who would like be supportive of the use of this approach. Uh, so this is this is one way to go. And then also uh, of course like uh, convince them to invest uh, invest funding funding into organizing consistency jury. So that's what happened in Edmonton there. And I think the fact that uh, internet voting was a very controversial issue also was a contributing factor because uh, the 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 the, pro, the city project team wanted to avoid the controversy. They wanted to hear from the public what the public thinks on this issue and whether they will be receptive to the introduction of um, uh, internet voting as an alternative method in municipal elections. Well, uh, Kleena, Nicole, do you have anything to add? I guess I, I guess th there is one thing that I would add, and that's the question that we raised earlier when we were sort of discussing before the interview about the difference between a citizen's jury and a citizen's assembly. Uh, because the way that the literature defines it, as Kalina sort of pointed out at the beginning of the call, is that a citizen's jury is typically composed of, you know, 12 to 24 members. Uh, it's a smaller group, much like a jury. 
Um, and citizens, citizens' assemblies, the way that we've seen them or the way that they emerged in Canada for the first time in 2004 in British Columbia and then in 2006 in Ontario, they were much larger, 160 members in BC and 103 members or participants um, in the case of Ontario. But then this past summer, we saw a citizen citizens assembly take place in Prince Edward County um, and that was composed of 24 members and it took place only over three sessions so a much shorter time frame <laughs> excuse me and then we look at the South Australian um, citizens jury which has 43 members but is taking place over um, several months and meets six times so I think a, an interesting question to raise thinking about future future research and ideas is what are the main differences between these different deliberative tools? Um, are they are, are, are they very similar? How are they different? Uh, and those sorts of things because it seems that um, that the two can overlap at least. So you think it's more of just um, like the goal is the same but perhaps one uh, the meeting times or the frequency of the meetings may, may be different and the number of people involved may be different, but overall the the goal on the end is the same. Yes, I mean my initial perception of the, dif the main difference between them was that citizens, citizens assemblies were a larger undertaking. They took place over a larger period of time, um, but I've been proven wrong now based on the, uh, the um, Prince Edward County uh, Citizens Assembly and the South Australia Citizens Jury because they sort of illustrate the opposite. Okay, so it, it sounds like a, they... a, an interesting question to raise for for thinking and future research. Okay, well, I also uh, want to add something, and it's about uh, you know like the cooperation. It, it's about the cooperation between like academia and government. Because like citizens juries and citizens assemblies and all this like innovative deliberative approaches, like this is not something that you know. Well, those are those, those are still considered experimental approaches, and like an important aspect of the process is to research the process and not just to design it for the policy makers, but also to research like um, and like evaluate the entire process because like. Sometimes, like there are certain shortcomings. Let's say you know criticisms about how the issues uh, are, be for example, how the issues are being framed when a citizen jury is conducted. How this uh, you know um, impacts like specific out or leads to specific outcomes. So integrating like research into the practice of public participation is very important, and it's one way to like improve the citizen jury process. And convince policymakers that it, it is very efficient, like and it's a good process. It's a meaningful way to engage citizens. So what we try to do, like in Edmonton, so parallel to the actual citizen jury process, we conducted like um, observations, and we also um, uh, we also like uh, asked citizens jurors, uh, citizens who participated in the jury process, to complete surveys. And evaluate like their opinion change over time. So, how uh, people's perceptions are being changed a result, as a result of uh, learning which is involved in the process. So, yeah, so it's very important that you know you integrate research and practice, like in public, public participation, in the design of any any public participation event. Sounds like good advice. <laughs> Well, uh, Kleena, Nicole, uh, thank you again for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you, uh, and I'm sure everyone is excited now that they've learned more about citizens' juries, maybe in some circles, citizens' assemblies. Um, and I am Aaron Hamlin with the Citizen with uh, the Center for Election Science, and we look forward to hearing from you next time. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you. <laughs>